Just a place for a snark, the bellman cried, as he landed his crew with care, supporting each man on top of the tide by a finger entwined in his hair. Just a place for a snark, I have said it twice, that alone should encourage the crew. Just a place for a snark, I have said it thrice. What I tell you three times is true. The crew was complete. It included a boots, a maker of bonnets and hoods, a barista brought to arrange their disputes, and a broker to value their goods. A billiard maker whose skill was immense, might perhaps have won more than a share, but the banker engaged at enormous expense had the whole of their cash in his care. There was also a beaver that paced on the deck, or would sit making lace in the bow. And had often, the bellman said, saved them from wreck, though none of the sailors knew how. There was one who was famed for the number of things he forgot when he entered the ship, his umbrella, his watch, all his jewels and rings, and the clothes he had bought for the trip. He had forty-two boxes, all carefully packed, with his name painted clearly on each. But since he omitted to mention the fact, they were all left behind on the beach. The loss of his clothes hardly mattered because he had seven coats on when he came, with three pair of boots, but the worst of it was, he had wholly forgotten his name. He would answer to high or to any loud cry, such as, Fry me or fritter my wick, to what you may call him, or what was his name, but especially thingamajig. While for those who preferred a more forcible word, he had different names from these. His intimate friends called him Candlelands, and his enemies toasted cheese. His form is ungainly, his intellect small, so the bellman would often remark. But his courage is perfect, and that, after all, is the thing that one needs with a snark. He would choke with hyenas, returning their stare, with an impudent wag of the head. And he once went a walk, paw in paw, with a bear. Just to keep up its spirits, he said. He came as a baker, but owned when too late, and it drove the poor bellman half mad. He could only bake bride cake, for which I may state, no materials were to be had. The last of the crew needs a special remark, though he looked an incredible dance. He had just one idea. But that one being Snark, the good bellman engaged him at once. He came as a butcher, but gravely declared, when the ship had been sailing a week, he could only kill beavers. The bellman looked scared, and was almost too frightened to speak. But at length he explained in tremulous tone, there was only one beaver on board, and that was a tame one he had of his own, whose death would be deeply deplored. The beaver, who happened to hear the remark, protested with tears in its eyes that not even the rapture of hunting the snark could atone for that dismal surprise. It strongly advised that the butcher should be conveyed in a separate ship, but the bellman declared that would never agree with the plans he had made for the trip. Navigation was always a difficult art, though with only one ship and one bell, and he feared he must really climb for his part, undertaking another as well. The beaver's best course was, no doubt, to procure a second-hand decker-proof coat. So the baker advised it, and next to ensure its life in some office of no hood. This the banker suggested and offered for hire, on moderate terms or for sale, to excellent policies, one against fire, and one against damage from hail. Yet still, ever after that sorrowful day whenever the butcher was by, the beaver kept looking the opposite way and appeared unaccountably shy. The bellman himself they all braced to the skies, such a carriage, such ease and such grace, such solemnity too, one could see he was wise, the moment one looked in his face. He had bought a large map representing the sea, without the least vestige of land, and the crew were much pleased when they found it to be a map they could all understand. What's the good of mercators, north poles and equators, tropic zones and meridian lines? So the bellman would cry, and the crew would reply, 
They're merely conventional signs. Other maps are such shapes with their islands and capes, but we've got our brave captain to thank, so the crew would protest, that he's bought us the best, a perfect and absolute blank. This was charming, no doubt, but they shortly found out that the captain they trusted so well had only one notion for crossing the ocean, and that was to tingle his bell. He was thoughtful and grave, but the orders he gave were enough to bewilder a crew. When he cried, steer to starboard, but keep her head ha larboard, what on earth was the helmsman to do? Then the bowsprit got mixed with the rudder sometimes, a thing, as the bellman remarked, that frequently happens in tropical climes, when a vessel is, so to speak, snarked. But the principal foiling occurred in the sailing, and the bellman perplexed and distressed, said he had hoped, at least when the blind wind blew due east, that the ship would not travel due west. But the danger was past, they had landed at last, with their boxes, portmanteaus and bags, yet at first sight the crew were not pleased with the view which consisted of chasms and cracks. The bellman perceived that the spirits were low, and repeated a musical tone, some jokes he had kept for a season of woe. But the crew would do nothing but groan. He served out some grog with a liberal hand, and bade them sit down on the beach. And they could not but own that their captain looked grand as he stood and delivered his speech. Friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. They were all of them fond of quotations, so they drank to his health, and they gave him free cheers, while he served out additional rations. We have sailed many months, we have sailed many weeks, four weeks to the month, you may remark. But never as yet, this your captain who speaks, have we caught the least glimpse of a snark. We have sailed many weeks, we have sailed many days. Seven days to the week, I allow. But a snark, under which we might lovingly gaze, we have never beheld till now. Come, listen, my man, while I tell you again the five unmistakable marks, by which you may know, wheresoever you go, the varanted, genuine snarks. <clears throat> Let us take them in order. The first is the taste, which is meager and hollow but crisp, like a coat that is rather to tighten the waist with a flavor of willow-the-wisp. It's habit of getting up late, you'll agree, that it carries too far when I say, that it frequently breakfasts at five o'clock tea, and dines on the following day. The third is its slowness in taking a chest. Should you happen to venture on one, it will sigh like a thing that is deeply distressed it always looks grave at the pan. The fourth is its fondness for bathing machines, which it constantly carries about, and beliefs that they add to the beauty of scenes. A sentiment open to doubt. The fifth is ambition. It next will be right to describe each particular batch, distinguishing those that have feathers and bite and those that have whiskers and scratch. <laughs> For although common snarks do no manner of harm, yet I feel it my duty to say, some are both tombs. The bellman broke off in alarm, for the baker had fainted away.